There's actually three parts to getting ready. Third part will be next uh, Sunday, which is Palm Sunday. Jesus is almost at Jerusalem. <clears throat> um, he was on his way to Jerusalem with his uh, disciples. We've got lots of stories about this in Luke's Gospel, um, <coughs> chapters 9 to 19. And all along the way, he's teaching his disciples things they need to know before they arrive at that place where uh, he's going to be crucified. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at um, this uh, one of the major themes of his teaching at this time. He wanted people to get ready, uh, ready to die, uh, ready to um, suffer persecution, which was going to come, and especially to be ready for the day when he'd be uh, coming again in glory. The second big theme that stands out in this uh, travel story is repentance. Next slide. Okay. Repentance, um, turning around, uh, changing your mind, going in a different direction. The period before Easter, uh, which is traditionally called Lent, it's a good time for self-examination for acknowledging our shortcomings and making a commitment to change. It's an opportunity to contemplate what our Lord Jesus was doing for us when he was crucified. I know we do that every week, but Easter, um, it, it just comes with a special force, doesn't it? When we realize the significance of that death and the resurrection that followed, our lives are transformed and we want to make some changes in the way we live. One day I was driving down a street in Canada where we had just arrived um, and we'd gotten a car. Um, it takes a while to get used to driving on the other side of the roads. Anyone had any experience of that? Um, you, you go to get in the car and you get in the wrong side. <laughs> Um, anyway, suddenly, um, uh, driving down the, the, um, the road, and suddenly we realised it was a one-way street. We were going the wrong way. And uh, Kathleen screamed out, Stuart, turn around! You're going the wrong way! <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the only time that happened. <laughs> <clears throat> Many times Jesus calls people to repent, to turn away from doing evil and to turn back to God and to keep walking in his ways. Um, so this message of Jesus was an essential part of his proclamation of the kingdom of God. It was an urgent message and it still is urgent for us. Jesus has come into the world as a light, Luke says in uh, chapter 2. A light that reveals God's ways. A light that can guide our feet into the way of peace. As followers of Jesus, as citizens of the kingdom of God, we need to be walking in the right direction. Walking according to God's standards so as to please him. So Jesus says uh, in Luke's Gospel, this is chapter 11, verse 35, Make sure that the light you think you have is not darkness. And that is, examine yourself in the light of God's word and see how he wants you to change. Uh, see how he wants to transform you. We're going to be exploring around Luke's gospel, around about chapters 12, 13, something. Um, but before we read some scriptures, we need to ask God to help us to hear them. So let's pray. Father, you require clean hands and pure hearts. As we hear from your word this morning, we ask that you will give us the desire and motivation to examine ourselves. We ask that your Holy Spirit will search our hearts and bring to our attention any attitudes or actions or words for which we need to repent. 
we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So the next slide has that uh, reference to um, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, know my heart, see if there be any wicked way in me. As Jesus travels to Jerusalem, he meets many people who need to repent. And he tells many stories about repentance. He teaches his disciples to recognise sin and to name it for what it is. So, the next slide um, can be a bit challenging. We're going to read uh, Luke 11, verses 37 to 41. Luke 11, 37. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before the meal. Then the Lord said to him, Now then, you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You foolish people, did not the one who made the outside make the inside also? But now, as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor, and everything will be clean for you. We'll stop there. So Jesus has dinner with the Pharisee, who notices that Jesus avoids the traditional and quite elaborate hand-washing procedures. Uh, so Jesus takes the opportunity to rebuke the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. They're concerned for their outward appearance of things, because everything has to look nice and clean, uh, but inside themselves they're full of greed and wickedness. So that's not the way to be a follower of Jesus. So I think Jesus is asking us here to examine ourselves, asking ourselves, am I? A hypocrite. Do I say one thing and mean another? Do my words and actions match up with my thoughts? What if people knew what I was thinking? What if my secret thoughts were uncovered? And Jesus says they will be uh, in Luke 12, uh, verse 2 and 3. He says, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. Whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. And so we need to bring our secret thoughts to God in repentance and have our minds cleansed. Next picture. Uh, Jesus has more to say to the Pharisees and to those of us who might behave like Pharisees. Uh, and this is in uh, chapter 11, starting from verse 42. Um, he says, uh, You do your tithing very conscientiously, but you neglect justice and you fail to demonstrate the love of God. Maybe we can call this a failure to recognise what's really important. I think this is a very common failure. Our lives are so busy uh, that they can become unbalanced. Uh, and things that we should be concentrating on become neglected. Uh, I know that's sometimes true for me. And Jesus goes on in verse 43. You, you love to have the best seats in the synagogues. And you love to be greeted with honour in the marketplace. Maybe we could call this uh, self-exaltation or having an, an over-inflated idea of yourself. Uh, have you noticed how advertising um, these days especially play, plays on this sense of our own importance? We're encouraged to treat ourselves, um, to, to pamper ourselves. You know, uh, go on, you, you deserve it. Uh, it's what you want that matters. 
And in its extreme form, this kind of attitude is called narcissistic. But we're all tempted to put ourselves first, aren't we? This is not the way to be a follower of Jesus. People who exalt themselves need to repent. But Jesus is not finished with the Pharisees. Um, next slide, please. This is 11, uh, chapter 11, verse uh, 46. Yeah, you load people with burdens that are hard to bear. Um, you can call this oppression. And this too is a lack of loving concern for human fellow, um, for fellow human beings. A failure to emphasize, sorry, empathize um, with the feelings of others. <clears throat> Jesus gives an illustration of this in the story of the rich man uh, in chapter 16. Um, starting from verse 19. Chapter 16, 19. <clears throat> it's a well-known story. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what, <clears throat> what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, Jesus doesn't <clears throat> explain what the rich man failed to do, uh, but we know what he should have done. He should have fed that man in his need. The rich man was oblivious to the needs of that poor beggar. And the story goes on. Uh, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between, he, uh, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they... Uh, will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So the requirements uh, for that rich man were there in the scripture all the time. Uh, Isaiah 58 says, Share your food with the hungry, clothe the naked, and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. And in Proverbs 21, uh, it says, Those who shut their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. The rich man wasn't doing anything about it. Eventually, it was too late for him to do anything about it. It was too late for him to repent. We need to ask ourselves, have I failed to empathise with the feelings of others? Have I not considered the effects that my words and actions might have on other people? Um, Next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> the parable of the fig tree in chapter 13 uh, speaks about repentance in a roundabout way. It says this, <clears throat> A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it, and he found none. So he said to the worker who tended the vineyard, for three years now I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and each time I inspect it, I find none. Cut it down. 
why should it continue to deplete the soil? But the worker answered him, Sir, leave it alone this year too, until I dig around it and put fertiliser on it. And then, if it bears fruit next year, very well. But if not, you can cut it down. In Jesus' context, I think he was probably thinking of that fig tree as a picture of the Jewish nation. But I think it also speaks to us of our lives as Christians. Uh, are we fully engaged in God's service? Are we bearing fruit? Or are we just occupying a seat in church? Uh, if we're not being fruitful, we need to ask why, and we need to repent. Next slide, please. Sadly, there are those in the Gospel story who refused to repent. Um, there were some who apparently had the idea that people become victims of crime and victims of accidents because they're sinners and God is punishing them. Jesus says no. We read about them in uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. Now there were some <clears throat> present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Um, Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. These people seem to have an arrogant attitude that says, I don't need to repent. But Jesus says, no, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then there were those cities, uh, Chorazin and Bethsaida, where Jesus had done great miracles, that people hadn't <coughs> recognised um, what God was doing. Uh, and Jesus says, if those great miracles had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which were Gentile cities, they would have repented long ago. And then we find Jesus lamenting about the people's lack of interest in the Word of God and their lack of response to it. Uh, this is in chapter 11, around about verse 29. And he compares them with the Queen of Sheba, who came from far away to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And he said, I am greater than Solomon, yet certain people have shut their ears to me. And then he compared them with the people of Nineveh, who repented when the prophet Jonah preached to them. Of course, Jesus is greater than Jonah, yet certain people refused to turn from their sinful ways. On the other hand, we have some stories of people who did repent. So this is the next uh, picture. We have the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, when he came to his senses, he said, I'm going to get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired workers. And that's true repentance. And we have the story of the tax collector Zacchaeus, who had cheated many people, making himself rich at the expense of his customers. The story is in chapter 19, and I'm not going to read it. You know the story. Uh, Zacchaeus met Jesus and he was transformed. Uh, he understood that restitution is an integral part of repentance. He said to Jesus, Look, Lord, half of my possessions I now give to the poor, and if I've cheated anyone of anything, I'm paying back four times as much. And then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this household. I'm sure Jesus uh, was rejoicing as he said those words, because elsewhere he says, There's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. 
Um, and he says it again. I tell you, there's joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. Uh, it's like the celebration scene in the story of the prodigal son, where they said, let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was a lost, he was lost and is found. But the story of Zacchaeus reminds us, doesn't it, that uh, just saying sorry is not enough. We have to put things right when we repent. There must be some attempt at restitution. The son was willing to work as a servant for his father. And Zacchaeus gave back what he had stolen. Words were not sufficient. There had to be some action. I've got a picture of a dark night here. <clears throat> Repentance is not just for new Christians. We can all be blind to sinful patterns in our lives. <clears throat> About 12 years ago, I went through a period of deep repentance. Uh, it wasn't a public sin. I didn't need to tell other people about it, but I did share it with my wife. Um, over several years, I'd let myself develop some wrong thinking and bad habits. I had failed to walk in God's light and I had compromised my integrity. It was unfaithfulness. It was sin. Um, God was merciful to me, but he didn't let me off lightly. He brought me to a place of severe discipline. He would not let me continue to make a mess of my inner life. I went through great, great emotional Pain, and through acknowledgement of my sins and God's great forgiveness, there was cleansing, there was healing. So I can say in the words of Hosea, God has torn me, but he has healed me. Thank you, Wendy. He has wounded me, but he has bandaged me. He has raised me up so that I press on to know him and live before him. And I'm sure that the angels were rejoicing over a sinner that repented. I think I thank God that he cared for me enough to show me how I needed to change. <clears throat> I have a picture of weeds. <clears throat> I'm always pulling weeds out of my garden. You are too, I know. Is that we are God's field. We should aim to be weed free. Now is the time to pluck out the weeds and throw them away. And another image is that we, we are God's building. Uh, so that there must be no little uh, side rooms where we keep all our junk. We need to acknowledge our failures. We need to let God deal with them and begin to build our lives again according to God's requirements. Um, John Powers wrote this, Failure is a wound that let, lets God in, a crack in the armour through which grace can move. God places before us his standards uh, and Jesus calls us to follow them. If I disregard them, I'm being disobedient. I'm deceiving myself, I'm a fool. So we have no right to commit ourselves to mixed standards. Paul says, I am not my own. I have been bought with a price. I belong to others. So the challenge uh, this morning is this. <clears throat> is there something in your life that you need to bring to Jesus? some failure that you need forgiveness for, <clears throat> some sin that you need to discuss with God. Uh, let me encourage you to come to God in repentance. If you reveal something, um, that there's something in your heart that doesn't belong there, of course he knows about it already and he's willing to forgive you for it if you bring it to him because Jesus took it on himself as he hung on the cross. And then if it's a public sin, 
if other people knew about it, uh, then you would need to confess it publicly to whoever was affected by it. And then we need to move on to what God has for us. Alert and expectant without being burdened by old sins, without being tied to old patterns. Ready and willing to let go of those things, whatever they might be, the things that will stop us from being faithful followers of Jesus. There's a certain song that meant a lot to me in my time of repentant discipline. It comforted me. I'm not going to sing it, but here's the words. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hands. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. I have a father. He calls me his own. He'll never leave me no matter where I go. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls and hears me when I call. I think Kathleen is going to lead us in prayer. a lot in that, wasn't it? Mm. And uh, you know, how, what, what is it that God's wanting to say to each one of us? Uh, he's, he's kind. He doesn't make <coughs> us uh, get overwhelmed, you know, by being told or, you know, that we're guilty of this, this, this and this and this. Is there one thing that he's speaking to your heart about? Just one thing. Is there one thing? Out of all of that, that um, Stuart has shared, which of course comes from Luke's Gospel, Jesus' words on his way to the cross, 